I'm Jason Bradford. I'm Asher Miller. And I'm Rob Dietz. Welcome to Crazy Town, where the local seed swap has been canceled for intellectual property violations. Hi, this is Crazy Town producer Melody Allison. Thanks for listening. Here in Season 5, we're exploring false prophets and the dangerous messages they're so intent on spreading. If you like what you're hearing, please let some friends know about this episode or the podcast in general. Now, on to the show. Hey guys, Rob, Jason, how are you guys doing today? Doing pretty well. Not too shabby. Good. I, I'll be honest, I spent most of last night on the internet oh. doing some digging on conspiracy theories. I'm oh. going to tell you why. When I feel particularly crazy, oh. I like to look and scan out on the horizon to see who's crazier than me. <laughs> yeah. It makes me feel a little bit more sane. There's at least sure. one or two of them out yeah. there. So I was feeling, yeah. it took a while. It's Here's about, the problem. It's I was, about relative status. <laughs> relative status. Yeah. I was feeling particularly um, verklempt or something. Right. I wasn't in a good place. So it took me like seven hours oh, of like geez. rabbit holing things. So I hope you can stay awake for So I was show. curious, like, what, you know, what conspiracy theory stuff have you guys come across in recent years? You're like, ah, mm, oh. oh, chef's kiss. That's there, beautiful. There's so many good ones. But yeah? the one that leaps to mind is the, the whole notion that JFK Jr. is still alive. And he's like working with Trump to fight the evil satanic Illuminati people. And I guess in Dallas sometime last year, <laughs> right, they thought he was gonna hundreds of people were gathered <laughs> waiting for him. So right. the JFK Jr. one. What, is a what good did one. they say when he didn't show up? Uh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> traffic. Know. Traffic yeah. sucks right yeah. now. You know. Yeah. Well, that that is a pretty good one. My favorite. So I used to live in D.C. and I would always take people to that. That very, very fake museum, the Air and Space Museum, because okay. they had this stuff on the lunar landing. Sure, yeah, yeah, totally What fake. lunar landing, that, right? That, that was my favorite. Is that We talked at some point about that uh, documentary, Room 237. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Stanley Kubrick was yeah. behind uh, the fake filming of the lunar landing. It's, just, it's brilliant. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, I wouldn't put it past him, honestly. I love it. I love um, it. Speaking of not putting past people... I'm going to go for one that's, that was quite common, you know, a couple of years ago. It, still beautiful in so many ways. Bill Gates microchipping us through the vaccines. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, that, that one is particularly relevant for us today because our false prophet is none other than the microchipper himself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we're, we're going to be doing Bill Gates. So let me, uh, for you guys and, and for our listeners, let me just run through real quick bullet points I, on Bill <laughs> Gates. I think most of us are familiar, but let's let's just... He plays tennis. By yeah. The way. Oh, well. That's, that's not true. Yeah, he's a tennis player. Oh. Yeah. All right. So he's uh, born in Seattle, Washington in 1955. He is a storied computer nerd, probably one of the earliest of that species, you know, he, he basically made it to high school in time to start messing around with computers. He goes to Harvard, drops out in 1975 to found the company Microsoft mm. with his buddy Paul Allen. Uh, and then he, of course, takes over the operating system for most of the computers in the world, becomes the youngest billionaire ever. And in 1995, he became the richest man in the world. Wow, that's a 20-year run from yeah. college dropout to richest man in the world. Yeah, Woo. yeah. Well, and then... Uh, Alexander the Great did it faster. Oh. <laughs> and it might have been richer, actually. <laughs> what, 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 relative terms? status. What college did Alexander drop he out of? He didn't need to drop out of college, buddy. <laughs> so, so then he goes on and he founds uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the year 2000 or so to address health and education issues. He gets named... Time Magazine Person of the Year with Melinda and with Bono. There's oh, nice. a little, little bit of trivia. The uh, lead singer of U2 jumps in there. And then in 2008, he shifts from being the full-time guy at Microsoft to being a full-time chair of the foundation. And, you know, he, he's, he's now a, a big giver instead of a, a taker, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. What a, what a, uh, a storied um, history there. We're done, right? The uh, podcast is over. <laughs> well, I, we're going to dive into some, You know, there is a little controversy and stuff. He, he, he got divorced recently, and so he's been in the news for that. And also the, the previously mentioned conspiracy theory that's popped up in yeah, the news. That's about, had to be his biggest news story, right? Yeah. I mean, if, I, I'm sure 
if you Google Bill Gates, you got to come up with microchip in the vaccine somewhere at the top of the list, right? Yeah, maybe a little Epstein stuff thrown in. Oh, there that's now. true. Yeah. <laughs> Allegedly. Alleg- yeah. 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 So he's got some notoriety in there, right? Yeah. For me, what's interesting about Gates, just in terms of his like career arc or whatever, is like there there have been some there's been some myth making around him or kind of a per- persona that was was created and I don't know if it was like in, intentionally created or if it just sort of happened but you know this whole idea of like he was this geek you mm-hmm. know he was portrayed a lot in the media as sort of like this this kind of geeky dude that you know smart, happened to smart. become yeah smart happened to become the richest guy in the world and that really hid the fact that the guy was a real predator I mean it was he was a shark and he the practices that, that Microsoft put into play in terms of like dominating the marketplace, becoming a monopoly, we could probably do a whole podcast just on that in terms of like false prophethood. Yeah, we won't we won't get into that. But you know, like my dad worked with him quite a bit and interacted with him. That persona, let's just say, of him being kind of the simple geek or whatever, not so true. Okay, yeah. So the other part of the story about his persona is he was kind of a you know a frugal guy who maybe had the uh, the calculator in his pocket and the pen kind of thing or whatever it's called and the, and the thick glasses and an unassuming eight burgers, you know, from his favorite fast food joint. But then he ends up building this just ginormous house over the lake, billion, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in value, whatever. It's crazy, crazy size, luxury, private jet around the world. So really, you know, they're, they're, he, he ended up becoming one of the billionaire class, really kind of, in some ways, going from this unassuming image to really sort of flaunting wealth in some respects. So Yeah, I mean his mansion is legendary, right? Yeah. Like 66,000 square feet. Yeah, but we're you know, we're not even going to talk about <laughs> how billionaires end up being corrupted by the wealth and just being overconsumptive, etc. We're not going to focus on that. Okay. Well, no. Okay. Nope. All right, fine. Another thing we're not going to focus on, but just has to get mentioned, is he is now the biggest private owner of farmland in the United States. He owns 242,000 acres. Uh, that's a little bit more than what yeah, uh, than you farm, got on yeah. the farm yeah. outside our studio Loser. window here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pretty, uh, you know, say what you will about that, but that's maybe a dangerous thing for somebody to own that much land. Yep. And he's right. He buys land around cities, hoping it's going to turn into another city kind of thing, too. So they call yeah. it transitional land. Yeah. He wants term. to build uh, smart cities in the desert. Yeah. You know. Okay. Smart. <laughs> yeah, very smart. smart. Very smart. <laughs> yeah. He's also a large investor in a bunch of different companies that are, are working on clean energy technology, so, so to speak, miracles, right? He has yeah. a, a fund called Breakthrough Energy. And, you know, he, he's been quite outspoken about climate. We could talk about that maybe a little bit later. But his push around, you know, this, this investments is beyond investing heavily in wind and solar and nuclear. He's, he's been looking for en- what he called energy miracles, you know, so, yeah. so investing things like that, which I have, just have to say, it reminds me of my absolute favorite cartoon of all time. Uh, by Sidney Harris. Do you guys remember that one where the, there's two people at a blackboard? Yeah. And there's like this whole math computation thing that happens. And in between like these two sections, there's like a, a little thing written on the board that says, then a miracle occurs. Right. 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 And the professor's like, I think you need to be a little more explicit here yeah. in step two. <laughs> yeah. That energy miracles is a really telling term. Yeah. And so, you know, in that in that book, he goes over this equation where CO2, so like emissions of CO2, let's say, is equal to the number of people, they call P, times the services per person, S, times the energy per service, or E, and then C is the CO2 output per unit of energy. And so basically he's saying that you have to multiply all these. All these factors go into how much CO2 is actually going into the atmosphere. Right. It's the number of people times the amount they consume times the amount of energy that's wrapped up in that times the emissions wrapped yeah, up in the energy. Exactly. Okay. And in order to get to net zero, which he calls about, we need to get one of these numbers to zero is the case. Like if you think of right. multiplying, just yeah, get one yeah. of this to zero. <laughs> well, pick one of the four. And so he picks... Just pick him out of a hat. He, he picked P, right? He wants zero people on the planet. <laughs> well, that's what the whole... That's the that vaccine, vaccine thing. is for. Right, okay, on, come on. Right. And, and the buying of farmland. He actually only wants one. He yeah. wants, he wants he buys himself. It, he's going to buy it all and starve us. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, well, okay, that was a whole other rabbit hole you yeah. can go down to. Um, but anyway... Of course, what he's asking for is these miracle technologies where we have zero CO2 emissions per unit energy. And 
honestly, we're actually not going to get into that, but other episodes will go into how kind of wackadoodle this is. Wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me there might be a false prophet who's got something to do with the climate miracle uh, tech uh, sector? There's many out there. There's many out there. It's a real growth industry, Rob. Invest now. Well, yeah, Gates is already investing. He's He's a leading indicator of what I should invest in. It is ironic. I have to say, you know, Gates is also pretty influential. He has this like... I don't think it's called Gates Notes or something like yeah. that. He he reads these books and then he writes like on a blog, you know, things that he's thinking about. And a lot of people read this shit. And he's um <laughs> he's talked a lot about and read a lot of Vaclav Smil's yeah. books, right? And and I find that so fascinating because it's like and, and the Duke could get on a call with him, you know. Bill Gates can you talk to him. You might have had to say who Vaclav Smil is. Yeah, let's let's he's I mean, he's one of the preeminent Voices uh, on energy issues, yeah, in, yeah in limits the world. to growth. And well, I wouldn't, these. you know, he's he's more of a a nuanced person. I think I wouldn't put him in the limits of growth camp necessarily, but he's absolutely someone who sees energy as a central, if not the central, driver of of society. Right, well, and, and he's he's done some amazing data analyses too, yeah. where he looked at the mass of land mammals right. and shows that ninety seven percent of remaining. Oh, that mammals, was yeah, that's uh, that's people and, yeah. and livestock, livestock or, and or pets. domesticated animals. Yeah. yeah. In any case, you know, Vakov Smil, I would say, is is much more of an energy realist. Yes. And apparently, Bill Gates loves his stuff, but then somehow can just compartmentalize. Or I don't yeah, know. Vakov Smil does not believe in miracles. Let's just put it that. way. Yes, <laughs> let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay, well, so we've cataloged a few areas we could have gone with Bill Gates as a false prophet, but I'm going to let you know why. We're, we're picking him for this episode, and it's kind of counterintuitive. The reason we're doing this is because of his, his philanthropy uh, and his, his second career as a philanthropist. You know, you'd think that he's trying to do good, like I was joking yeah. around. He's now a giver instead right. of a Right, why taker, are we giving him a hard time? Why? But, well, why? I mean, we're, yeah, let's talk about this. I mean, it, it's really nice because he says that I believe with great wealth comes great responsibility. So you know, <laughs> Spider Man. Yeah, he's got Uncle yeah. Ben's wisdom. <laughs> Uncle it's, Ben. Yeah. So that's good. You know, anybody that believes like that's got to be all right. And he, he wants to give back to society. Uh, what, what's the rest of his quote? He says it's a responsibility to see that those resources are put to work in the best possible way to help those most in need. That sounds, mean, yeah, sounds, sounds fine nice. with me. Yeah. I mean, I, know. I mean, so, I mean so, good for him. So what, why are we uh, picking him again? What's wrong with this uh, philanthropic? Okay, view? well, let's, let's turn to that, his philanthropic exploits. Okay, so he actually established the foundation, the Gates you know, Foundation thing, in 1994, okay? But of course, he didn't quite retire and go full-time to that until more recently. But it, it, it's now the largest philanthropic foundation in the U.S. with an endowment over $50 billion. And it has been involved with projects related to the eradication of infectious diseases, focusing on things like malaria and polio that don't get a lot of dollars from the wealthy nations, transforming food systems near and dear to my art, eliminating poverty, <laughs> climate and energy, a little bit nods to that, as well as, as, well as transforming education. I'm just, just a, maybe this is a spoiler alert, but I'm thinking his way of, of changing food systems might not be that near and dear to your heart. Oh, well, let's, let's, let's not tip our <laughs> hand here. Let's just, right. let's just go through let's this. Just, I, let's just see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, like, so I've been involved in nonprofit work since, what, 1996. And I think it's hard to underestimate the impact that the foundation has had in the world of philanthropy. I mean, really sent shockwaves when he first really endowed this this huge foundation. He has so much wealth. He was the richest man in the world. You know, then he had Warren Buffett throw right. money in, in after him and be like, whatever Bill wants to, you know, invest in you know, with his philanthropy, I'm gonna I'm gonna back it. And, you know, they were they have been the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room for a lot of things and in in part also for like their approach to philanthropy and what they expected, you know, they were pushing for certain like measurable outcomes and, and certain things that change the culture of philanthropy a lot. Now we looked up actually, have we fact che- checked how much gorillas weigh? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, well, it's probably more than 800 pounds. I don't know. It's a, I don't know. There's, there's the mountain gorillas. There's the lowland gorillas. There's male. There's female. It's, it's, it's uh, complicated. It's well, the, the gorilla will be our next false prophet. So we'll be sure to get those facts <laughs> yeah. together. 
Well, so let's dive into his his African food and farming odyssey. Mm. So the the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation essentially launched this group called AGRA, which stands for the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, Rockefeller Foundation was also a backer in 2006, but it's two-thirds funded by Gates. Mm -hmm. And the point of it was to increase food output on the continent. And over the last 17 years, AGRA has spent a billion dollars trying to double crop yields and income for for small scale farmers across thirteen countries. It so sounds pretty pretty comprehensive. Pretty big, yeah. yeah. And of course, uh, maybe that green revolution moniker sent a few shivers down the spine. So the the idea is Agra is reviving green revolution ideas, promoting high yield seed varieties that are fed with synthetic fertilizer and of course protected by doses of pesticides. Can, can we just make sure that our listeners know what, what we mean by the green revolution? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the going back to Norman Borlaug, the idea of we got to increase uh, his his specialty was wheat, but mm-hmm. basically small grain crops and and we've got to grow as many as we can as fast as we can to support uh, the burgeoning population. And it was a it was a combination of mostly the merger of breeding for the ability to use these synthetic fertilizers. And so right. historically the the crops could only use so much nitrogen. So if you applied more nitrogen, they're like I don't know what to do with this because nature never had that much nitrogen right. available. Yeah. But what you were able to do with the breeding, and Norman Borlaug figured out, was he could breed for these crops that have very heavy yields and because they could use the nitrogen, but they also were agronomically harvestable. So part of the problem was, for example, you add this nitrogen, the crops get so big, and then they just fall over, they lodge. Mm-hmm. So he figured out how to make these dwarf varieties of wheat that yeah. would stand up still and could be harvested by combines. And But that technology suite got applied then to all kinds of crops, staple crops, not just wheat. Yeah, pretty much any grain, right? Yeah, grains and like soybeans or whatever. So, And obviously it had a huge impact in terms of world population and yes. hunger and all that stuff. It, it was also a vehicle for converting fossil fuel energy in a sense. And it postponed, you know, the the Ehrlich population bomb, right? It It's sort of that that fear got diminished by the fact that you suddenly had massive increases in in yields of agricultural products. Yeah. Kind of an interesting note about Borlaug is he he said exactly that. He said, "Hey, yeah. this is a good solution, I'm putting that in quotes, for the time being. You know, we've kind of pushed our problems out into the future, but don't pretend like you can just keep doing this forever." And I know, he- I, you know, when I read about Norman Borlaug, I actually see the guy was a very complex human being that understood the broader aspects of what he was doing. He wasn't a pure, like, technology solves everything. I, okay, somebody who might not have understood the broader aspects <laughs> is Bill Gates. Can, yeah. we, can we turn, uh, yeah, yeah. turn to, to yeah, this? Th- let's, yeah, so let's, let's get back to Bill and Melinda's excellent adventure in <laughs> farming and, and food production in Africa and, and, and why we want to talk about it. So there's a guy named Alan Goubert. Who, no, uh, no, 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 that's Alan Gebert. He's Gebert, a buddy of ours. Me. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he writes the food and farm file, which is uh, he's he's hilarious. He's snarky yeah. but super Rob insightful. Well. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, I mispronounced your name. Al. Yeah, sorry. I Al. like that. We're gonna start. I'm gonna call him Goober from now on. <laughs> <laughs> call him Goober. Right. He grew Alan up on a Goober. on a dairy farm. Yeah, in the Midwest. Yeah. yeah. Any case, so he you know he wrote back in September 2022 something called "Given What We Don't Know, Why Do We Act Like We Do Know?" And he he's sort of. Uh, it was a perfect setup for this whole exploration of of people like Bill Gates and, and the foundation coming into Africa. And I'll quote here, most of American agriculture sees Africa as one vast nation and one vast market. It is, of course, neither. Africa, in fact, has more nations, 54, more languages, over 2,000, and more cultures, 3,000 plus, than any other continent on Earth. It's also the world's second largest and second most populous continent with three times the people and twice the area as North America. Given our broad ignorance of Africa, why do we still think we know what's best for this culturally rich, incredibly diverse, enormous continent's farm and food sectors? Well, because I have a billion dollars. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, so what 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 happened over the past seventeen years in Africa with with Agra and and ex- trying to export the Green Revolution? So Timothy Wise, a research fellow at Tufts University, said that instead of this sort of doubling, right, there was a thirty percent increase in hunger across those same thirteen nations where Agra was applying Western techniques, and. Where there were gains in yields, they could be attributed more to extensification, so the addition of more land under cultivation, Mm -hmm. than to the intensification or more crop production per acre. Yeah, and there were other poor results environmentally as well. There's strong evidence of negative impacts like acidification of soils because you got these monocultures and you're cultivating with with synthetic fertilizers. Yeah, Same things we see here. Right. And there was little evidence of significant increases in the incomes or the food security of these small scale food producers. There was a lot of indebtedness as farmers were unable to pay loans that they took out for the seeds and fertilizer. Agri farmers were also stripped of their autonomy as they were restricted to using the seeds and the fertilizers that were mandated by agri project leaders. And this led to the decline in more nutritious staple crops of the regions like sweet potatoes and millet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. That's great. Great. Good. Good results. But it was. It <laughs> was a lot. It was well intentioned, guys. Yeah. Well, it's not surprising too to know that Agra has extensive ties, of course, financial ones, with the big agribusiness firms like Bayer and Cargill, and yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're just running through things now. We're going to go in more critique later. So that's sort of the basic for their their food and farming transformation of Africa. But we're going to have more to talk about. Yeah, well, so look, if you look at what the Gates Foundation does, this is an enormous foundation, right? It's the, what I think is the the largest private foundation in the United States. There's a lot of areas that they they focus on. I want to focus on the vaccines, though, right? And in fact, this is probably the area where they've gotten most attention for the foundation's work. Both both in the real side and the conspiracy theory side. So in... 2010, they announced that they're, and and they were doing stuff before this, but this is an example. In 2010, they announced that they would be spending $10 billion over the next decade on developing and deploying vaccines in the poorest countries around the world for diseases like polio. They really had a goal of eradicating polio and also trying to figure out ways of tackling malaria. Oh, my God, a huge problem. Yeah, these, these kill or maim, you know, or just make people just sluggish. People. It's just I've I've known a lot of people that have malaria off and on, and it, it's it's awful. More than that, though, I would say they've gotten attention in more recent years for their involvement in in COVID vaccines yeah. specifically. I mean, to his credit, Bill Gates warned well in advance of the risk of a pandemic. He uh, he gave a 2015 TED talk, for example, titled "The Next Outbreak: Why We're Not Ready." Yeah, and, and they may have been readier than our government or the public because they kind of started doing stuff when the pandemic hit. So Gates Foundation and key partners in, in the vaccine work, they collaborated and lobbied for distribution of vaccines. So they spent almost $10 billion since 2020. So they're really pumping wow. out the money. That's the same amount as the U.S. lead agency that's fighting COVID abroad. So... <laughs> You know, you basically got uh, the Gates Foundation doing the work of a government. They set up this thing called COVAX, which is a consortium that wanted to get testing and vaccines deployed in countries that are low middle income. It's kind of interesting, maybe similar to the farming deal. They, they didn't really achieve their objectives. So COVAX had this aim of delivering 2 billion vaccine doses by the end of 2021, and it had only delivered... 319 million doses, so fell quite a bit short. And only 20% of people on the continent of Africa were vaccinated as of August 2022. Yeah, Hmm. there's a great piece that was done by Politico and another um, newspaper, I can't remember right now, sort of investigating the, the role of Gates Foundation and these Gates Foundation and Welcome Foundation jointly funded projects. There's there's kind of like a spider web. I don't want to be, you know, conspiratorial minded about this, but of like organizations that have been set up over the years that the that Gates Foundation has had its hands in that played this really big outsized role kind of in deployment. And to their credit, they were advocating, they're trying to advocate to get vaccines and testing in low and, and middle income countries. But there's some big questions about the approach that they took. So 
the biggest controversy of all to me is is their opposition to lifting intellectual property protections, right? Mm-hmm. So Gates has been very outspoken directly, basically, about it. And Anand Giridharadas, yeah, yeah, sorry, Anand, um, journalist. Alan Giebert. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing up names today. He's um, a journalist and author of a book that I think people should really read that's very apropos of, of this topic on philanthropy called Winners Take All, the lead charade of changing the world. And he wrote a little bit about Bill Gates's attitude towards intellectual property of the vaccine makers, right? Um, and he said, quote, directly asked a, during an interview with Sky News if he thought it would be, quote unquote, helpful to have vaccine recipes be shared. Gates quickly answered no. Asked to explain why not, Gates, whose massive fortune as founder of Microsoft relies largely on intellectual property laws, that turned his software innovations into tens of billions of dollars in personal wealth, said, quote, well, there's only so many vaccine factories in the world, and people are very serious about the safety of vaccines. And so moving something that had never been done, moving a vaccine, say, from a Johnson Johnson factory into a factory in India, it's novel. It's only because of our grants and expertise that it could happen at all. So Nan goes on, he says, well, who appointed this billionaire head of global health. Well, he did. <laughs> this was a quote from Nick Dearden, the executive director of Global Justice Now, which advocates for patent waivers. He was asked that in light of Gates' comments. And then what he said, Nick said, it was like, oh, I guess he did. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> I would like to appoint this guy. He's looking in the mirror. <laughs> well, what's ironic is he gives the example of India, which is one of the major pharmaceutical producers on the planet. Like, well, it's back to this idea of like we know how to do stuff, right? Best, and these poor countries don't know. Don't it's know just how to do bizarre. Yeah. It yeah. is bizarre. Well, that's what I mean. Is, is calendar each day? I say, appoint myself chair of global health. <laughs> appoint myself chair of the the tennis team. Appoint myself yeah. chair of whatever. Well, you say you know you don't want to be conspiratorial. This web. Well, I think that those are the real conspiracies. Like there are people out there with enormous influence and power. And yes, they talk, they communicate, they have webs of relationships. Oh, that's the real conspiracy we should be looking it's at. It's a web. Remember Uncle Ben and Spider Man. Uh. <laughs> okay, listeners, I want to remind you all that I, I have this paper out. <laughs> It's called A Species-Level Taxonomic Treatment of the False Prophets with Hypotheses on Their Origin and Evolution. Has this been peer-reviewed, this paper yet? Well, Rob's looked at a part of it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you know... Dylan it, the dog. It'll, I love Dylan. It'll go through uh, rigorous peer review uh, by the time it's on our website. But anyhow, this was a pretty straightforward one, and it's not that exciting. We've had some exciting false prophets. The Cyborgian, uh, a Kurzweil, was pretty exciting. But Bill... Bill's a classic double downer, all right? And and we've had them before. And these are basically guys that, you know, they know we're on a completely unsustainable path, but they basically believe we're just going to keep doing what got us into this mess only harder. And um, they really believe in some kind of technology that will help us get through this, but they're they're kind of agnostic on the details. Like Bill is just like invest in all these companies. I guess that's true. Energy miracle. Yeah, energy miracle, magic seeds. It's yeah. all it's all going to happen. It's all going to happen. So I don't have a lot more to say at this point, but um, the paper what, is looking good. Um, what's the Latin name on that double downer? Okay, this is kind of tough. Homo deorsum duplici. Now, see, I thought since you were the designer of this taxonomy, <laughs> you'd be like it? Homo deorsum Brad Forty. I or... don't practice these. <laughs> I don't practice saying these. Oh, things. you're right. That he would have named it. Yeah, I'm he just just would have named it after, after himself. Yeah, okay. You he actually, you're not allowed to that. name it after yourself. I've uh, got a couple species named after name me. It? Name after Rob. No, I could, no. I could name it after Rob. No, no. Ah, Ditsia. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to dive into the troubles here with with our false prophet and this broken model of philanthropy. But before we really start hammering those points, I, I do want to say that I think Gates and the Gates Foundation, there's there's some positive there, right? I mean, it, first of all, very, very good intentions, working in parts of the world that maybe are, are underfunded or don't have as good of access to resources as other parts. There's 
Also, this issue of trying to invest in in things that governments or businesses aren't ready to invest in. So I, I think we, we, we want to be careful not to just say that it's all bad. Yeah, maybe it's more about approach. And that's part of what we want, why we want to talk about Bill Gates and and this approach to philanthropy. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, one example is, you know, you can think of climate. I mean, you know, his starting point is climate is real. We've got to do something about it. That's what that book uh, that he wrote recently is about. But the Koch brothers or, or you know, other, uh, quote, yeah. philanthropists aren't exactly uh, right. in that camp. Yeah. Right. Now, of, of course, at the same time, he's he's got his uh, hypocritical sides. Uh, you know, he, he likes to fly around in a private jet. That's been in the news recently. Like, why are you flying around the world in a private jet and then telling people to reduce their emissions? Yeah, it, it, that's tough for all these super wealthy people. I, I get it, you know. Um, not everyone that's a billionaire is like that, but I see why it's it's hard to av- avoid doing that in some respects. Well, I've been asking why you're cruising around your farm in that electric golf cart, you know, when, <laughs> I, when I have to walk. Well, yeah. it's a Rolls Royce golf cart. Oh too. my God, that thing is so awesome. <laughs> Serious power. Yeah. yeah. You got the little champagne holder <laughs> in it and everything. Oh I, yeah. I toss fertilizer. I, I hate it when I'm. Be- I hate when I'm behind you, and all that cigar smoke is just wafting back. Uh, uh, yeah. My tobacco farm is fantastic. <laughs> okay, so yeah, okay, dude's a hypocrite. Check. I mean, we could we could say that about a lot of people. Yeah. I think not the three of us here. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Yeah, you're right. Of course, God, we're not hypocrites here. No, no. So I want to talk about kind of philanthropic colonialism. So if we, if we think about philanthropy in this kind of philanthropy as sort of an expression of the colonial mind, do you know, this idea that like you're coming in to a place and you know best, you are full of your power, yeah. your sense of, you know, like in the case of like, we've talked about this in the case of like early colonization, right? It was like, supported, sanctioned by the Catholic Church. Right. You're yeah. there to convert these poor heathens. The poor heathens, right. You know? I know, yeah. So it's it's a little bit of that same mindset of coming in and saying, we need to lift these poor people out. They are losing out on life, right. on the potential of life, on progress, right? Right. And, you know, in one case, it was like, you guys are going to die and go to hell. You're not going to go to heaven. In this right. case, it's like, you're not fulfilling what your life's purpose is. Access could be to or, modernity is the yeah. greatest thing we can so give. So we you. need to lift people out of this, yeah. right? I, so I take them out were... of poverty and subsistence agriculture and all that. That. I thought you were referring to they're missing out on having a closet just loaded with trinkets and, and too many clothes. Well, they'll get there. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you get them into the cities, you know, you you have machines do the labor, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they get their, they get their goodies. Yeah. I think of it as uh, savior syndrome is a, a phrase that kind of sure. popped to mind. Like, haha, I, I'm going to come in and tell you how to run things because, you know, look at, look at how well I've done where, where I am. And, and um, look, people have written extensively about this. There are organizations that work on these issues, like uh, Oakland Institute does really important work in Africa and other places around sort of land grabs and sort of taking people who've had traditional ways of living, subsistence agriculture, you know, these these tight local communities, and either relocating people to cities, as you mentioned, Jason, yeah. or, or basically taking these folks and just like wiring them directly up to the global economy. You know, now you have to be producing for the global economy. You're not, you know, as we talked about with the agri stuff, like you're getting seeds from us, you're getting all this stuff that you have to use as things that we're telling you to use. You're you're in debt to us. You're in debt to us. And you got to sell to these markets. And that basically under the guise of saying, Oh, we're lifting up, you know, we're, we're creating more prosperity for you. Putting aside whether that actually happens or not for a second, it's the idea that now you have to be absolutely plugged into the global economy and you're dependent upon it now. Yeah. There's this interesting notion, and we're going to get into this in other episodes, so I'm not going to belabor it, but there's the idea in in the agricultural world, actually, so it, it applies in this specifically as well, of the notion of sparing versus sharing approaches to preserving biodiversity in nature. Hmm. So the sparing approach is what the Gates Foundation is doing. They're basically saying, when you have people who have to interact with nature for their subsistence, they are destructive to nature. And the world cannot have people doing this kind of 
of livelihood because they are going to destroy the planet. And so their their thought is that we will have to move into cities, make their agriculture more efficient so you can spare the space and nature can now thrive. The other approach that you see is the agroecological approach was the sharing approach with nature. The mm-hmm. idea being people can live in place and have livelihoods if they do it in a way that is responsible, humans and nature kind of co-evolve and cohabitate places. Look, I'm in favor of conserving areas and sort of maybe not keeping people out, but, you know, like you restrict what you can do in them, like a national park or Mm -hmm. something like that. And we've we've discussed on this show the half-Earth deal that E.O. Wilson's foundation uh, supports and the idea of just space for nature. But to take people off of the land and say, you you can no longer act responsibly and and have some livelihood based on on the resources available. That's re- that's utterly ridiculous. I mean, it's, it really is insane when you think about it because you look at indigenous communities. Yeah, and let's take fire practices. You know, right. let's take uh, how people do with forests. Right, it, it wasn't like we had these pristine, untouched forests in North America, it was that the indigenous communities had a relationship with the land. You know, they would practice basically preventative fire techniques and things like that. Mm -hmm. And now we're learning, actually, that maybe we should think about implementing those versus what we've been doing. Right. And so it's it's just, a, it's amazing the hubris of thinking that we, well, we know best, right? We know best on how to do stuff rather than think about these indigenous communities, these land-based communities where you have countless generations yeah. who have built this incredible repository of knowledge that gets passed down from generation to generation about how to live with the actual land that they're living with yeah. right? and dealing with scarcity. And we're going to go to them and say, you guys and, don't know what the fuck you're doing. And dealing with risk. They also know the reason they don't just grow one highly productive crop is because they hedge. And so they don't do monocultures and they don't do the high yield grain. They also grow these tuber crops, for example. I mean, they're hedging constantly because nature is variable. And, and they all just worry about the climate. And Bill Gates will talk about how the, the climate is going to really harm these people. We need to help them. It's like they actually have a lot of the basic understanding of how to hedge risk and, and survive right. and persist. Yeah, but how much money do they have? <laughs> I mean, come on now. Yeah. Well, and I also think about what all that does for the human soul, right? Mm-hmm. So you're talking, Jason, about taking people off of, of their traditional land and putting them in cities as part of progress or whatever, yeah. you know? And again, you know, I was just saying you have these communities with with countless generations of knowledge, and we're going to look at them and be like, you guys don't know what you're doing. We also have, we are a species that has evolved co-evolved with nature, yes. literally symbiotic relationship. Yes. You look at your gut biota, right? right. And, and we're going to say, no, we got to take us out, stick us in these cities, these, these artificial yeah. environments, right? And it's like, no wonder, I mean, this is simplistic, but no wonder people are sick. No wonder yeah. people are depressed. And now we, there's what's called nature deficit disorder. We've dis- right. <laughs> disconnected people from, from you know, where we've evolved to live. And it's very similar to, you know, in some ways, like the perfect metaphor for this perfect in a really dark way is how we had taken, we thought it was wise to take young children, you know, children from Native American communities, you know, yeah. here or First yeah. Nations in Canada Take them away from their families yeah. Yeah. and Awful. stick them in schools to basically indoctrinate them into Western culture. And we're doing this to save them, right? right. To help them. And what, what, what happens? It's a good analogy. Uh, They're depressed and suicidal and yeah. miserable. And, you know, maybe they, they turn to, you know, dependencies on things. Whatever it is, it's like... Well, I love it how we, we take uh, these concepts. Like, you talk about forest bathing. Like, it's a scientific... Right. Thing that that uh, it's healthy to be that used to like be a living. new discovery, <laughs> right? It was, yeah, you, you'll go out and bathe in the forest. <laughs> you just we're living. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, and I guess that's one of the things I discovered when I started farming was how happy I was. And then then they started like, oh, you know, these soil organisms produce this organic molecule that when you breathe, it like makes you happy. You're like, oh, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there's more to the the philanthropic disaster than just the colonialism as well. I think the entire model is built on something utterly screwy. So you have 
the idea that a, a person like Bill Gates amasses this incredible fortune by, you know, essentially runaway, ruthless business practice, right? right? You monopolize and beat the crap out of your competition. <laughs> and then and, you get to play God. Yeah, then you build a <laughs> philanthropic endowment and right. use that endowment to combat all the problems that occurred because of the ruthless runaway business practices. <laughs> it's kind of kind of circular. circular economy, <laughs> Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it's really frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It's almost like this little feastum, like I said, I imagine God or it, who 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 decides now how all this wealth gets spent? And it's Bill, right? right. He's appointed. Yeah. Or he's yeah. he's self-anointed. At least that guy, as I said before, he has a heart and he seems well intentioned, conspiracy theories aside. But yeah, you can come up with all kinds of foundations that are tax free, you know, nonprofits. Right. Uh, they're doing just horrible work, like Post Carbon Institute comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but like there's the Ann Rand Institute. There's you know, <laughs> right. all these uh, just wonderful. I, I wonderful. think uh, well-intended, benign, or ruthless and evil, wherever they are on the spectrum, the bottom line is there is an accountability there, right? I mean, these foundations are accountable to their own board of directors, their trustees, you know, which are usually the people yeah. who have made the money in the first place, you know, and people the that, same people that they basically. know. Yeah. And, you know, we could have a whole conversation about like the decision making and the strategy of foundations to address that you, you made, you made this comment, Rob, about like going in to try to fix a circular economy of fixing the things that you basically broke in the first place. That's a little bit of philanthropy as well, you know, and, and to think that the, the people that are often the trustees, the directors of these foundations, who themselves profited and benefited from that system, that they're going to look at that system in a way and say, oh, we we can actually address and should address the source of the problem in it. Yeah. Well, the other thing I, you know, I think is important is not – so there a lot of hubris thinking they know what's going on, but there's also the applying this sort of business model sort of perspective to everything Yeah. that we have to turn – we, you know, it's almost like, okay, we, these people need to be given these, like in the, the Africa agriculture example, a suite of things they can buy to, to, to grow things they can sell. It's like, first of all, they're trying to make subsistence farmers business people. And I think it's because they're, they're, they're trying to carry over their business success. The idea that if they have success in business, they know now how to create success in other realms of the of, of of policy. And and I just don't think that's necessarily true at all. Yeah. I think one of the things that you see a lot is they think profit has to be an incentive for right. doing something. So you were talking earlier about the vaccine a share and and how the Gates uh, his his response of no, we don't want to just make this right. freely available right. or yeah. we need to protect that intellectual property and earn profit because who's going to make this stuff unless you can take away billions of dollars. That goes way back with him. Uh, I don't know if you guys were aware, but when he left Harvard and started Microsoft, almost right off the bat, he wrote this open letter that was really aimed at at computer hobbyists, people that were screwing around with programming at the time. Hmm. And it was to rail against the sharing of software. Hmm. He was like, this is a terrible practice. And his, there's some merit to his argument and that he was his point was, those of us working on making software, we need to be able to make a living. Otherwise, we're not going to spend the time on it. We're going to be off doing something else. So that, you know, yeah, to a to a point that makes sense. But for freaking sake, like, you don't have to be so protective of everything that you become the richest man in the world because you, you were able to secure that intellectual property, right? Uh, you know, some of the greatest things people do, they do because it's about something... They find joy in, they find pleasure in, they want to give beyond them, you know, beyond their own selfish, narrow interests. They they want a community. They want to, and so it's like it's just crazy that that's what he thinks it drives people's behavior. And it's a it's one element of of what drives behavior is. Yeah, I need enough to get by, but most people this need enough to to meet their basic needs, and then they want to flourish in these other ways. So I yeah, I just think his entire model of how humans. What motivates humans right. is wrong. And it's not just his model. I mean, that's why you brought up, Jason, this sort of business lens to yeah. view all of this stuff. Right. And, you, and, and we refer to him as a double downer. And, 
And I have to say, like, I think that there's a, a, a valid rationale for what he's saying, at least saying in that letter, if I if I interpret it correctly, which is, look, you know, you, you can't expect people just to, to make this stuff and you not pay for it, basically, because right. people will stop making it or it'll be shitty or whatever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And in the system that he operates in, the capitalist world, capitalist economy that we've created, that's a rational argument. You know, you could we could look at, well, how do you incentivize and create a different system where if people's needs, essential needs are met, they're motivated to create things and share it with the world because of other reasons, yeah. other other motivations. So I think there's a validity to that argument. It's just what you had said, Rob, which is like, you go from that to like, now I'm going to utterly dominate <laughs> you know, the computer software space, right? And ruthlessly destroy all competition. You know, it's like... You didn't have to go that far, dude, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, hey, but, hey, I wrote a letter about this, okay? I do have to go that far. <laughs> See, I was right. Um, I want to get back to something you said, you talked about, Jason, or maybe you had said, Rob. I don't know. It, tapping in, it's like convincing through, like, the, the work that they're doing in Africa. You got to get the seeds from the market. Yeah. You know, you got to buy from the market, and you got to sell to the market. You know, and this whole idea that, like, plugging people into the market is the best thing you could possibly do for them reminds me a lot of the conversation we had about Bill Clinton, right? right? Where he was, like, really into these public-private partnerships where we can meet the needs of society and the most disadvantaged among us by by really using the profit motive of businesses to kind of like create these new markets or whatever and mm-hmm. lift people out of poverty. And and that's that same sort of mindset to public-private partnerships. He's talked about, that. Bill Gates has talked about this a lot, and it certainly was the approach to sort of like the COVID stuff and the vaccines was like, we have to do these public-private partnerships. We got to get these these pharmaceutical companies and they should be driven by profit motives and we partner with them you know, as public entities. But- Always support the profit motive. Right. You know, always. Again, there's a logic to it, right? Because he's trying to invest where a company or a government wouldn't. But with his investment, he's hoping to bring them in and sort of spur some broader investment. So you kind of like that idea, but there's... There's there's a limit to it. Wait, but also I should just say, like, there's this also this role of philanthropy in it, right? So we're talking about public-private partnerships between government and businesses, but... In a sense, also, foundations are now stepping in to meet some of these. You know, maybe there are these areas where there isn't profit to be gained, right? So found, it's the role of foundations, you know, which is basically pennies on the dollar of profit that people, individuals have made yeah. out of the system, usually exploiting something, nature or other people, <laughs> right. right? Now being put to areas where maybe there isn't a profit that could be had somehow, so you can't rely on corporations to to do it. So philanthropy will do it. But never the really the role of government, our collective resources being put to bed. Well, I, I do want to protect the forest. So I was going to start a timber company, cut it down, sell it, and then uh, use the profits to buy a quarter of the land back and, and put that in a preserve. How, you guys like that idea? You, you with me? You're an evil genius. <laughs> well, th- this is brings up me to another point, which is this whole businessification. Is that a word? Uh, it it might work when you're trying to sell software or whatever. You're you're basically you have a very easy thing that you're after. You know, you're trying to sell a product, yeah, or market service, a product. Yeah. So that you can maximize your profits and build shareholder value, whatever. You know, the thing that unifies businesses. Well, that's so much trickier in the world of policy. You know, you have these huge issues like poverty or climate change or the food system doesn't work right. And so there are there are a lot more goals. It's a lot more complexity, a lot more people involved. And you can't just act like some dictator and go in and fire. And often the and often the goals are of public policy are different than the goals of business. In fact, they're the opposite, right? I mean, selling more Cheetos is not a public policy outcome that we're trying to achieve. It's unfortunate because America has done really well on uh, that front. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And and you reduce it down to things that you can measure. And those are not necessarily the things that are actually best, right? It's it's a pretty simplistic way of approaching things. Yeah. You know? You know, with policy, as our colleague Richard Heinberg has talked about pretty extensively, you, you tend to run into predicaments, not simple problems. These right. are 
very, very complex issues. When you try to apply some fix, you often have unintended consequences. And I don't know, maybe Gates has had a couple of unintended consequences (laughs) along the way. I think there may be a strategy here that we're not recognizing, which is maybe the whole microchipping people... It's just a way of solving that predicament. Let's make sure that everyone acts in a certain control, way. We can control them. <laughs> yeah. The evil, hey, evil genius take, again. I just take back everything I said about Gates. <laughs> okay, now is the time. Now that we've uh, roasted, roasted Bill Gates, we get to sort of sum it up in a simple insufferability index. Reminder, this is based on zero to 10 criteria. Zero would be like the real good people, like Harry Potter. 10 would be like Voldemort. I don't understand that one. Okay. <laughs> well, he was really good. Or Nelson Neville. Mandela. Well, you're, okay. not, you're not very well read a share, so I wouldn't, you, you couldn't get that reference. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Hermione, maybe. Um, or Hermione. I, Her- Hermione. What was that? Hermione? Her- Hermione. Her- Hermione. Now you got his disease. It's Alan Goubert and Hermione. <laughs> anyway. Isn't that a... Is They're that going a, on a tour together. Can yeah. you order that in an Italian <laughs> restaurant? Give me, the, give me the Hermione with the red sauce. <laughs> That's a dessert. <laughs> Anyhow, so what we're going to deal with is their intentions. You know, are they malevolent, power-hungry, selfish human beings? Are they good with a, with a, a nice awareness of the poly crisis? Personality, do you, do you, do you like them? Are they nice enough? Or do you, you couldn't stand to be in the same room? Um, ideas, are they completely wackadoodle? Are they, are, would they, could they be a fellow of Post Carbon Institute? And then score is bias. Okay. 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 All right. So. I, I want to start. Cause, yeah, go for uh, it. I actually got to see Bill Gates live. Oh, nice. Uh, oh, man. I know. I was. Did in, he do an encore? Well, yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> After we put our lighters <laughs> up in the air. And, uh, Free bird! <laughs> so, so he came to my college. I mean, honestly, the mythology was so intact, because this was probably in 1992, 93. Sure, so he was he, still in college. Yeah, yeah. He, he was like the head geek of the world, right. and Microsoft was probably like the coveted job to yeah. go out and get. So he, he seemed pretty pretty cool in a like geek sort of way to me and uh, I also just want to say like his intentions they seem good I don't know despite what you said a share about probably his his geeky persona being a, a facade of sorts I, I don't know like I I feel like he might be a nice enough guy so your score is bias might be kind of leaning towards giving him an extra point I, I don't know I'm just thinking on the intentions okay, personality okay, okay, side it. I'm so not do you have I'm not score scoring for- him much but pretty bad on on his hubris and 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 uh, overstepping into places where he shouldn't be. So I, I, I'm kind of in the, I think the three to four range. Pretty low. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I'm gonna. I have a little bias because he is a tennis player. I saw him do an exhibition uh, match uh, doubles with Roger Federer on TV. He on TV. It wasn't. Okay. I wasn't there because he didn't. He brought professional tennis to Seattle. And which hardly ever happens. Pro tennis rarely comes to the West Coast of North America. It's very upsetting. Um, so anyway, I, I give him a little bias there. He's not completely wackadoodle. He's a double downer, so he's got to get a point there. <laughs> he's he you know he's a little full of himself. It's obvious. So I'm gonna give him I'm gonna give him a a, a, a four as well. All right. Yeah. Okay. The scorer's bias is going to come into play here for me. Okay. First of all, intentions, I'm going to score him low on that. I think in the, by low, we mean in a positive way, right? Yeah. So I think his intentions are actually pretty good. So I'm going to give him one for that, right? Mm-hmm. Personality, I'm going to mark him higher because I have it on good authority oh. that he's a fucking asshole. <laughs> I see. Okay. Oh, that's his At least he was scoop. in business, in the business realm. Like literally yelling, screaming at people, you know. He seemed nice on the court. Oh, did he? Okay. Oh, God. Yeah, and when he was hired to give a speech, he seemed nice. So. Okay, so I'm, okay. you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for a solid. I'm gonna go for like two and a half there. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, and then ideas. I'm, I'm kind of with you, Jason. I'm gonna go pretty low there. I think he's not a total wackadoodle, right? right. So I'm gonna give him a one. Right? Yeah. So we're at four and a half. But here's my, here's my scores bias. Yeah. Okay. This is given the dude. Benefit of the doubt, because allegations are alleged oh, right. of other behaviors Yes, that if were they were true, right. would put the dude in fucking Voldemort territory. Right. Can we just acknowledge that right. without getting into it? Okay, yeah. so that's my little caveat there, my okay. little asterisk. I forgot about that. So you got him as a 12 then. 
I get them at a four and a half right now, pending further information that might send it all the way into the 10. Well, I want to congratulate Bill for being the lowest on our insufferability index thus far. He's under a five on average. So congratulations. Other podcasts ask for a lot of stuff. Buy their merch, join their Patreon, donate your left kidney. But we're just asking you to share the show. If you're like me and you find it funny and thought-provoking, then please tell three friends. Hit that share button and get some other people joining us in Crazy Town. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. I want to let our listeners know as we get going on the do the opposite that before we really get anywhere, we're going to send Bill an award for his uh, his banner score on the insufferability index. So. I, I, I think we got to wait until the end of the season. Yeah, yeah, right? we don't know. And then, oh, true. He, crown a champion? Okay. I think he's, he's got a good shot at it, okay? I know what's coming he's up. He's on the seriously on the leaderboard. Yeah, he's on the leaderboard for sure. I don't think he's going to get knocked off He's on. putting up good scores. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Good job, Bill. Okay, so on to... What a skewed (laughs) scale we have, by the way. (laughs) Like if Mr. Rogers were here, he'd be like, what the fuck? (laughs) I'm the least least of the worst. (laughs) Okay, so in the do the opposite realm, how about if we start by not having these goddamn multi-billionaires in the first place? Uh, Interesting idea. How about that? Yeah. Hmm. And if we're going to allow that kind of business to take place, then let's tax them. And the the sad part about this is that even Bill Gates agrees with with what I just said. One point, his father was in charge of the foundation. That's how he started it. He's like, I'm going to make the Gates Foundation and dad, you, you run it. So Bill Gates Sr., was, he partnered with our buddy, friend of this podcast here, Crazy Town, Chuck Collins. Mm. Uh, we interviewed him and, and he's a uh, on our board here at Post Carbon Institute. And so he and, and Bill Gates Sr., they advocated for upping the estate tax. And Bill Jr.'s on board with that. Yeah, he's been okay. supportive of that. Okay, yeah. that's so, good. So Bill himself wants to do the opposite. Isn't that interesting? It okay. Is interesting. Well, I th- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come at this from the perspective of, of agricultural, food system, farming. And I'm just thinking about like, there are all these groups in Africa doing work that is really counter to Gates. It's almost like that you've got these like Mothra and gorilla um, in Africa. That's really bad. Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> did, other, you, did you just take a Godzilla villain and pair it with a, a pseudo <laughs> King Kong? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was just horrible. We're going <laughs> <we're laughs> to up Jason's coffee and be right back with more on agroecology. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I wouldn't want to call him Bambi, but like... It, it, why is it two evil things? I know that's wrong. Anyway, what you got in, what you've got going on is there's there's people who think about what to do if you have extra money and you have like you, you're do gooder, you maybe you're you're on the Peace Corps or whatever, and you're going somewhere. And there's other there's different ways of approaching other cultures and thinking about quote unquote development and what it means. Mm. There's the the Gates Foundation way, which seems to be um, everyone needs to be like us and modernize and go into cities. And then there are people who actually have a respect for these other cultures, who are who are interested in learning about them, maybe even preserving or enhancing their life, but not in a way that's domineering, more about questioning and, and partnering. And I think those approaches need to be supported, okay? And, 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 and I want to kind of turn turn this around a little bit because... The sickness we have in, in, in our modern world, this nature deficit and, and our, our inability to probably do anything functional to, for our own survival aside from making money and then buying stuff from the machine is really awful, I think. And if you go to these places where people are, quote unquote, poor or subsistence, um, sure, you, you, you may have a hard time relating to them because they, they're, they're in such a different world than you, but maybe that's because you your your culture is kind of screwed up 
and you need to learn from them. So anyway, that's sort of the do the opposite. Maybe we should be thinking about how to sort of just be a little more circumspect about the full-throated modernism we're all about and not have so much hubris, but have some humility when we're looking at these other cultures. Maybe we need to learn from them. I, I think it's a really interesting point there, which is, I think one point you're making is that that actually this whole thing could be flipped on its head instead yeah. of us, quote unquote, coming from the global north or the west to rescue people in Africa or in the global south or in indigenous communities, that maybe the knowledge transfer might need to go in the other direction. Yes. But at the same time, what I guess I would add to that is let's not colonize their wisdom either, their knowledge and yeah. practices. like. The the approach needs to be one of humility yeah. and learning and reciprocity rather than like, holy shit, the consequences of everything we've been doing for the last couple of centuries are coming to bear on us now. Yeah, oh, we're desperate. We need you. To tell us what to do. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. which is still an exploitative sort of approach, yeah. you know. Um, and, and is there a role for some of modernism to... to merge a little bit with some of these places and some form of development that's, that I think that, Ray Kurzweil is working on, on that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I mean, vaccines might be kind of good in some cases and maybe some of the communication devices totally. we have. I mean, so yeah, I'm not saying like well, it, don't help in any kind of way, but well, but face it in a, in a different kind of perspective. It, it's not going. like there isn't a role for scientific knowledge and expertise. I mean, you you started off talking about agroecology, sure. You know, which is about a kind of farming that takes into account the sense of place, the soils you have, the water, you know, yep. kind of permaculture types of thinking. And is willing to learn from sort of folk wisdom, so to speak. Right, folk wisdom, but also there's a scientific piece And you can do tests that. and you can improve. And, yeah, 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 I mean, totally. that, I, I see you operating the farm this way. You oh, know. you have? Yeah. Nice. Uh, you, you I just see him in his Rolls Royce, uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> With the cigar smoke <laughs> walking yeah, out the back. No, I, I do take that saying. seriously. I consider it, yeah, it's, it's not easy. It's because I didn't grow up in this, you know. I guess I would just add, so think about doing the opposite, and here we are talking about Gates' foundation in philanthropy. Let's talk about doing the opposite in the role of philanthropy itself. And I would say almost like you think about this as sort of like degrees of change. You know, one is a different approach to how philanthropy sees itself, you know, and I think we are starting to see some philanthropists who come to their philanthropy with much more humility. Mm. You know, they see that the financial wealth that they currently have to share as as not theirs to give. So they don't feel a control over it. They don't necessarily feel like coming with those resources has to be like sort of a dictation on like what you're supposed to do. And in some cases, you see philanthropy actually turning over some decision making oh, to NGOs, setting up systems where they're really turning towards experts out in the field, sometimes the very NGOs that they support mm. to help them figure out where they should be investing. So seeing this much more of a partnership, I think if you go deeper than that, it, you start exploring what is the role of philanthropy, what's it born out of a good friend of PCI's, Al Norlada, and his partner in writing, Lynn Murphy, wrote a really, I would say, profoundly challenging book called Post-Capitalist Philanthropy, healing wealth in the time of collapse. And, wow. that's, and that's like, a, in some ways, it's like a love letter to say, let this go. Mm. This is not yours. Do you know what I mean? All of this wealth comes from basically the exploitation yeah. of, of people and, and nature. You, mu you have to let it go. And, and we have to let the system that created that go. And, and even further than that, it's looking at, one, the fact that we're relying so much on philanthropy to fix issues that are caused by the, the economy and responsibilities that the government has vacated, Yeah. right? So we have to reassess that. And two, recognizing that the entire philanthropic model is built on growth. It's built yeah. on the whole edifice of it, the whole idea of you, you have an endowment, you grow your endowment, and you're giving 5% a year on that. And what you're actually trying to do is to keep growing your endowment more than you're spending it. Right. Is pathologically Ridiculous. insane. Yeah. It's part of the growth system. It only works if you're growing. And growth so far, as we've talked about, is built on consumption. It's built on exploitation. It's built on the natural world. That's fucked up. Yeah. You know, it, it's not sustainable and we have to completely rethink that altogether. 
Yeah, I want everyone to know that what you just said is protected by intellectual property right. rights. Thank you for, and yeah. uh, we plan on selling that. So anybody out there who wants to buy some wisdom, uh, you know who to call. That's our show. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard and you want others to consider these issues, then please share Crazy Town with your friends. Hit that share button in your podcast app or just tell them face to face. Maybe you can start some much needed conversations and do some things together to get us out of Crazy Town. Thanks again for listening and sharing. If you are like millions of patriotic, overweight Americans with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, you struggle with a painful dilemma. You want to get the COVID-19 vaccine to save yourself from the Chinese Fauci death virus, but don't want the Satan microchips from Bill Gates running around your system, stealing your identity, and awaiting the signal from the Illuminati via 5G cellular to destroy your pituitary gland. Until now, you may have been paralyzed with indecision, but not anymore. Based on the same technology that has kept JFK Jr. alive and unaged for all these years, NanoSafe is a pill-based supplement chock full of nanobots programmed to scout and scour your innards to immobilize and destruct the evil microchip trackers lurking anywhere in your holy corpus. NanoSafe, fighting evil and saving patriots with nano supplements. Crazy town, da 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 da